Let's get back to my message back on October 4th, U.S. Presidents and Israel, a blessing or a cursing from Understanding the Times, Fall 2014. The tide turned, obviously, with this man, Harry Truman, 1945 to 1953. Harry Truman had parents who loved the Lord, who loved the Jewish people, told him to do so. And beyond that, Harry Truman had a good friend. Good friend, his name was Eddie Jacobson, Jewish man. They were in World War I together. They were in business together. Anything Eddie Jacobson said to Harry Truman on his shoulder, he listened. Eddie Jacobson said, you get involved in this little struggling state of Israel, Palestine, that's going to become Israel. Get involved. And Harry Truman listened. And he met with Chaim Weizmann in 1947 because the state was in the process of becoming an official nation. Not quite, but it was almost there. And obviously it did happen in uh, May of 1948. And just uh, 12 minutes after it declared its independent status, Harry Truman said, one of the proudest days of my life occurred at 6.12 p.m. Friday, May 14, 1948, when I was able to announce recognition of the new state of Israel by the government of the United States in view of the long friendship of the American people for the Zionist ideal. It was particularly appropriate that our government should be the first to recognize the new state. That was 1948. When we look at the present, we've gone a long way in the wrong direction, but I am getting my, ahead of myself. Obviously, in the next election, not only was he expected to lose, they said there's no way he could win, Harry Truman, because there were three Democrats running, and they were going to cancel each other out. Dewey was a slam-dunk, no-brainer winner. It was a given. Well, God had other thoughts. Did he honor Harry Truman for his strong stand for Israel? I don't know. It's possible. I would say that's even likely. And Harry Truman's burden would be the Jewish refugees in the, in the displaced persons camps in Europe, as, by the way, which is where Anita Dittman was. And she was able to get into America, thanks to Mr. Truman, because he sent a rep to those displaced persons camps, and he was just appalled at what he learned. And so he allowed uh, 80,000 Jewish refugees to get into America in the mid and late 1940s. A great friend of Israel, however, when that War of Independence came along in, in 1948, remember Israel was a nation, and within hours, these Arab armies descended on her to annihilate her because this cancer had moved into their territory. Truman and the State Department wanted no involvement whatsoever. They would not arm the Jews. America stood on the sidelines, as was going to be another president here in a little a while. But... Ben-Gurion said, we have only a 50-50 chance of survival if someone doesn't get involved with us and help us in this war of independence. Nobody did. They had only nine obsolete airplanes and this little ragtag bunch of Holocaust survivors defeated these Arab armies. One of the miracles of the 20th century, without a doubt. Even though America didn't get involved, no one got involved. God got involved. That's all you need. This is perhaps the mystery of all presidents. And Dwight Eisenhower liberated the camps. He was horrified at what he and his troops came across. He said to the troops, he said, take pictures. No one will believe us if you don't take pictures. And so they took pictures. And it was uh, quite a sight. He was very, very troubled, obviously, by man's inhumanity to man. Yet, Dwight Eisenhower would go on. The Eisenhower years were going to become, and, and were called, the coldest years in Israel-U.S. history, including the Carter years. Israel's socialism bothered Dwight Eisenhower. And the Arabs offered containment of communism, and that was huge to Eisenhower. So he opted to show his support of the Arab kingdoms, the Arab world, and oil, and he abandoned Israel. And this man was speaking into him. All these men have 
men on their shoulders whispering in their ear. John Foster Dulles was very troubled by the Jewish influence that dominated the scene. That was the quote here. The Israeli embassy is practically dictating the Congress through influential Jewish people in America. Well, with a voice like that speaking into Dwight Eisenhower, you can imagine he wasn't too friendly to the Jewish people. And then February 1957, Eisenhower joined with 75 other nations in the UN General Assembly in passing a resolution deploring Israel's occupation of Sinai. Well, along came a gentleman who would be a friend of Israel, John Kennedy, 1961 to 63, but he had one huge hurdle to overcome, namely his father, who was a well-known anti-Semitic fellow. He hated the Jews. Kennedy was able to hurdle that somehow. Actually, John Kennedy said way back in March of 1956, before he was president, he said it's time that the nations of the world in the Middle East and elsewhere realize that Israel is here to stay. She will not surrender, she will not retreat, and we will not let her fall. He had to deal with uh, Gold My Air. He was actually the first president to sell arms to Israel. He tripled the amount of financial aid America gave to Israel. He was a good friend of Israel, but his brother, Robert, was as well. Robert Kennedy assassinated in 1968 by a Palestinian, Sirhan Sirhan. Both Kennedys were very troubled by the treatment of Soviet Jews, and John Kennedy's foreign policy, they said, could be summed up in three words. Nasser, Nasser, Nasser. So all he could really think about in that, that region of the world was subduing Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. So he took his eyes a little bit off of Israel to focus on containing the Arab world. And when uh, he died, the, they built a memorial, John F. Kennedy Memorial in Jerusalem. We're playing my message from Understanding the Times, Fall 2014, U.S. Presidents and Israel, a Blessing or a Cursing, if you just join me. And we'll talk about how you can get a hold of this uh, in just a few minutes. Now we come to an administration that is truly mysterious. You'll never believe that Lyndon Johnson was called a righteous Gentile. And I'll explain why. Again, we can have disagreements with these gentlemen's politics, and I certainly do with some of them, probably all of them. But when it comes to how they treated the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, well, that was kind of a different story. He had a grandfather who said, take care of the Jews, God's chosen people, consider them your friends and help them any way you can. Another thing influenced Lyndon Johnson, and that was back in 1945, he took a trip to Dachau. That left him apparently shaken, stunned, bursting with overpowering revulsion and incredulous horror. It stuck in his mind what had happened. Not only that, but somehow, and just what the connection was, I'm not sure that history is revealing, Lady Bird Johnson would say sometime later, Person after person plucked at my sleeve and said, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for your husband, Lyndon Johnson. He helped me out of Europe. So during the war, he somehow got a number of Jews out of Europe into Texas. Again, not sure exactly what the connection was, but uh, he was able to do that. And because of that, he's often been called a righteous Gentile by the Jews. Now, again, as with Truman, he decided he wanted no involvement in the Six-Day War. He sat it out, and uh, complete neutrality, and that war could have been avoided if America and NATO had warned Egypt and Syria against aggression. The world sat it out, that incredible Six-Day War. How many wars last only six days? Huh? In history, how many last six days? Well, when God's involved, because no nation would get involved with Israel in her Six-Day War. When God gets involved, again, it doesn't matter if anybody else is involved. And uh, America benefited with the defeat of Egypt and Syria. But again, she got totally stayed out of the Six-Day War. And then Lyndon Johnson, after the Six-Day War, told Israel to keep all the territory it had, it had won in the Six-Day War, in the Six-Day War. 